I'm Terry Lopez and I'm a local artist here on Maui and I love teaching art and being part of the art community and I'm always looking for um, new ways to interpret my art. So this show came up, the collaboration show, and it get, I was thinking in my head this is giving me a great idea to collaborate with an architect. So I talked to Peter. I had met Peter in a different little art class we took together, portrait class actually, and uh, this is Peter Neese. He's an architect here on Maui. Hi, I'm <laughs> Peter Neese, um, born and raised here, local architect, owner of Maui Architectural Group, and I've always loved being creative. Went to Haleakala Waldorf and then Seabury. And Terry came into my office after I'd taken a class that she was leading. My mom and I went and took it. And she asked if I would be willing to collaborate and create some pieces of art together. And I looked at all my work and I said, Yes, let's do this. <laughs> let's make it happen. And then we started talking, and it was, yep, really fun and exciting. And I learned some new things that I've always wanted to know how to do. And it's, yeah, great experience. Yeah, it really took off because I came in with kind of an open concept. I wasn't really sure how I was going to put this together because I needed, I, I really like putting opposites together. So something very mathematical, rigid, uh, formal, static, but then put it into a landscape that's kind of more representational. And I think they're opposites, but I wasn't really sure how this was going to all fit together because putting just plunking down a house plan or something didn't quite fit. And then I was thinking, well, maybe I should do some paintings, like paint a little plantation house, because I think all artists here on Maui love it's kind of romantic a little bit, but the plantation houses are disappearing, but they have such a history at the same time. So I'm thinking, how can we make this interesting? So that was my original thought, to maybe start with a plantation house and juxtapose with historical, like, dicky information, double pitch roof. How can we put this together? But anyway, then Peter, like, talking, we, he showed me his sketchbooks, and I was, like, so fascinated with them because his process is so creative and it just really made me realize what an art form being an architect is. I mean, he has to listen to his client, somehow pull what the, his client's trying to say to him, pull it all together. Where do they want their living room, the view, the winds, the sunshine, all of that, and make it fit within, not only for them, but within their environment. So I was really drawn to how much of an art form being an architect is. He has to listen to his clients, somehow pull all their ideas together, but also the, deal with the environment. Think of the site where he's at. Like, which way does it, does the sun come, the wind come, the, where's the view? And pull all that together. So anyway, in doing that, while he's talking to his clients, he comes up with these little thought bubbles. Like, say for example, your friends, uh, a family, a young family here on Maui, and they have a couple kids. And why don't you talk about that process? Um, yeah, it's, it's probably the most enjoyable part of the process. The design, initial schematic design concept, um, just, it's where you get to be the most creative. And we'll sit there and just list all of their wants, their dream house, what's everything that they would like to have. And then we'll start talking about the relationships of spaces to each other and how they want to live in the space and how they want to wake up and drink their coffee and what are they going to do when they get home from work. And just, it's so different with every person and every project that it, it's what I love about my job probably the most is that it's always changing, always different. Then when you factor in all different building materials and the possibilities, it's just limitless. And when you get the right clients, you get to make these basically livable sculptures. And that's what really excites me. And it's, it's rewarding. Like as rewarding as I can 
I can't imagine something being more rewarding than that. Um, but yeah, so going through the sketchbooks for me is a, a fun process because I've put so many different thoughts into every line and color and thing that I've put in there. So then when I flip back through it, I'm looking at it and going, oh yeah, we wanted the pantry to be off, off the entry instead of off the kitchen. And all of these thoughts are in my head and it just comes back flooding through my mind when I look through the sketches. So to work with Terry and look through these things, that means so much more to me and to my clients when we've gone, gone over it together and talked about it, that it's just amazing to see it in this art form that Terry helped put together. So yeah, it's exciting. It's really cool. <laughs> so being born and raised here changes things a little bit for me probably compared to some of the architects that maybe move here. I was born and raised in Haiku. I love it out there. I love the country aspect of it. And the parts of the house that I grew up in, like I, I was raised with an outdoor shower all the way until I went to college. And when I went to college, I built an outdoor shower and got in trouble for it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> But it's the big covered lanai's, the shaded outdoor areas, enjoying the outdoor space, enjoying Hawaii for what it is, the environment, and not just creating a space where you're boxing yourself in and separating yourself from the environment. And so the Hawaiian style architecture, like Dickey's split pitch roof, if you take the traditional roof, there's low overhangs, maybe three feet long, but it's only two foot six when you do the math. So, so it just made sense to create this split pitch and create that covered lanai. And it's really popular um, from when he did it back in the, I'm not actually sure, maybe 1920s. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's that plus so many other regional moves that we do, like here in Makwau Town. It's amazing to see all of the small town design elements like just in the detailing, the, the soffits, the vents, corbulas, they all come together to make it its own unique character and place. And it's important to keep that. And I, I see a lot of, uh, I call it disposable architecture hap get created and it just, you don't get the flavor and the, the warmth behind it that's so important for us to try to capture and take the time to be creative and make, make buildings and spaces that are appropriate for Hawaii, otherwise we'll lose our sense of place. And then, you know, it's like I had done a little research getting ready for this project, and so I had specifically with Dickey, and so that's why we have one piece that's pretty much devoted to him, and it's um, Charles W. Dickey. And what's interesting about him, which I never knew, I knew he designed a lot of buildings. He'd been in Hawaii, had a, a part of an architectural firm with Hart, and then came and did all these buildings in Maui as well, like the Wailuku Library, the old lava, the beautiful old buildings, so gorgeous. What I didn't know until I really kept researching him, he was born and raised in Haiku as well. No, I take that back. Born, he was born in the mainland, but raised in Haiku, and then went to the mainland for school and came back to Hawaii, which is the same thing. It's such a parallel with you. Wow, I didn't even know that. Did actually. you know that? No. And it's like, I thought, what a cool thing. And that's why he was so sensitive to the environment also. Because like that, that split pitch roof is a big deal and it's very uniquely Hawaiian. It's not really anywhere else, is it? Yeah. I don't think so, or not, no? No, we're the so. first ones to really take advantage of it, I feel like. Yeah, I think it's, it's been copied and it's the one thing that's endured. And it's like the high ceilings, big windows, all to take advantage of the trade winds, but also have your windows open when it's warm and have the rain not come in. So the rain's out there. You know, it's like six or eight feet away. Yeah. And you keep your house still open. It's a fabulous idea. And, it, it, and good ideas do endure. And anyway, that's very Hawaiian. Yes. So I, anyway, that's where we kind of were thinking about how wonderful this is. So the, the first thing is, tr we're, we're sitting here looking at these beautiful sketchbooks, the two of us together, 
And I had this idea like, okay, well, how are we going to copy these? Are you going to redraw them? How are we going to make this happen? And then also, which medium, which form is it going to take? Are we going to work with acrylic, maybe a resin piece, maybe, I don't know, I kept thinking oil, no, that's not going to work. And so we came up with the encaustic idea. I said, you know, if I use encaustic in real pure color, I can create environments because the whole point of the architecture in the environment, it's the two things together. So use colors that are representative of Hawaii. So we got the blues, which is the ocean, a couple shades of blue, the greens, which is we all think of cane fields, even though we're starting to lose them, but it's still part of Hawaii. And then the rust, the red dirt colors, the golds and the browns. So just those three colors, that's it. And some white, white space, where we could put these drawings in there. And then, okay, so we thought if we use encaustic wax to get the color, then how are we gonna get the drawings in there? And which drawings and how are we gonna do this? So we decided on Silk Gampy because it's so forgiving. You can print on it, you can paint on it, you can draw on it. So we did those three things. There's a few places, some of the pieces have hand done drawings that Peter did right on the silk gampy tissue. Some of them, uh, there's a, a painting, a little painting that I did of a house in one of them, the Dickey piece. There's a little house in the background we painted on the silk gampy. And did a couple of them, a couple colors, trying to make sure that it would integrate together. And then, um, and then Peter, we started using the Silk Gampy, you can print, you can make copies right out of the sketchbook with the intent of keeping that freshness. Because sometimes when you try and copy, I think something you've already done so beautifully, that freshness leaves. And so trying to keep that also, that element, the freshness, we decided to um, copy them using onto the Gampy Silk and then rip apart the Gampy the, the little images that we have, the colored versus the floor plan, black and whites, and move them around and try and find a way to integrate them. And in that process, we found out there's big parts and little parts. The big parts being the big finished plans and the little parts being the thought bubbles, the, the little special elements, the little roof detail that you're talking about or the a window detail. and so we kind of found a bridge between the real organic form of the encaustic wax and then the static floor plans. We put all these little pieces in. Another piece we did was the um, we, a thing we found with a bridge was the plants. That was kind of funny. We thought, oh, this looks really good. There's a little coconut tree that's been that you drew in, and and I don't know. It just it all seemed to kind of come together. And so trying to keep the colors representational, keeping uh, the line work. I think this piece up here is kind of interesting because it's, you did drawings of his, what do you call this? The template. The templates, the little, that the architects use. We put those in there too. A couple things that really stood out in my mind when I was first approached this project was the split pitch rough and also the stone work that's almost craftsman style that you see a lot in Honolulu and up in Manoa, those old houses, but they're done out of lava rock. And so those elements we first were kind of zooming in on before we got to the rest. But anyway, so he was going, okay. And so he, he you talk about that, I guess. So when we're talking about the importance of the regionalism and things that are appropriate to Hawaii, um, we brought up the use of, of moss rock or lava rock which is used in, on Maui, mostly in the old ranch homes, um, homes from the late 1800s. You see it in the stairways that when you enter up into the home, they have really nice, gives it a nice foundation and ties it into the earth well. And so that's what this piece was about, is different ways that we do it um, originally with the post, ways that, this is from one, a building plan we'd done it's not my favorite way. It's where we mimic it with this veneer, kind of a fake thin stone. And then how, how we tie it into the ground and some of our more homes of today where it, it really softens the edge of the home because you have this linear, made-by-man, straight lines everywhere. 
object on this on the organic natural no straight lines earth and so doing things like this just softens and blends the edge and it's it's a technique we like to use for sure and this piece is called rock solid which we were like what are we going to call all these and i thought that's so appropriate yeah late at night we're all done going what are we going to name it he came up with that name most of the names and speaking of the templates thing this is our design template that we put plumbing fixtures in with so these are all it's just a fun way to add character and it almost feels like it could be tribal or tattoo like and yeah just it made sense in its own way yeah I'm thinking back uh -huh. yeah and then this one down here we, may, we might as well talk about this the little we're talking about the detail of makawao yeah. so small town keeping a sense of place yeah, and this is just an awning detail on how to get things, people protected while they walk up and down the street. And a lot of the things I have to say um, are more real world where the county and the building codes have taken things away. Like for a while, they weren't allow, allowing any awnings in the streets. So if you look at Wailuku, all the buildings have these scars down them where they used to have these great awnings that covered the streets and make it a walkable streetscape where people want to participate in it. Some silly person decided that you shouldn't shouldn't have the awnings because of truck beer trucks might need to go up on the sidewalk. It's definitely not a code made for Maui or Wailuku or our small towns, but it got implemented so awnings had been removed. And this the same thing is true with with um, single family homes, like the traditional Hawaiian plantation style home. Everyone, everyone here talks about affordable housing. We need to do affordable housing. And I was in front of county council and they said, how can we actually create affordable housing? And I said, take it back to single wall construction, the old school plantation style homes. And they laughed and said, oh, that'll never meet today's code. And I said, if you want to make it affordable, there's your answer. We have homes that are well over 100 years old and their foundations are flat river rocks with the footing posts coming down on those and it's totally fine. So yeah, I'm a little bit jaded from building codes and having to meet current requirements or just seeing how some codes or just issues can take away from the character of and not allow my design palette to be what it could be potentially somewhere else or somewhere that's less restrictive, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not that I would ever want to leave Hawaii. Um, <laughs> you know what the best part about architecture is? Every single person participates in architecture, no matter what. Everyone is at least an amateur architect and they have opinions about buildings and spaces and streets and their bedroom and a bathroom and I don't like the sink right there and no matter what every single person can relate to architecture and that is exciting and fun and it makes it so easy to strike up a conversation with any person anywhere in the world and you can just oh I'm an architect instantly we just hit it off oh yeah well have you seen this building and it's and I, I have to give some credit to my dad who's an architect He's an, he is an architect here, and, and uh, he never pressured me to become an architect, um, but always suggested that I keep doing creative things, like take all the art classes I can in college and AP art twice at Seabury. And, and then it just came full circle, and I was like, wait, I can be creative and get paid for it and have it be my job. And then now I love it. Like, I would, never want to do anything else <laughs> so good okay well working together was so successful i think there we really if i had to name a challenge it was only that we were trying to find the time because both both of us work full time and busy jobs but we wanted to do this so peter your time i mean your time management was incredible i think like stayed up all night what he almost stayed up all night and slept in his office one night to try and make this happen 
Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Just busy, a lot of different projects going on, but this is something that I care about and I knew it was just going to make me feel better, and it did. And I'm so glad we took the time yeah. to do it. And, and then you making your home available and getting to go up there, which is a special spot, yeah. and just be creative and play with ideas and talk, yeah. talk through different layouts. And it was so fun. I think, I think the other thing, n never mind challenges, it was all so good, so wonderful, but having Peter share his sketchbooks with me because a lot of people their sketchbooks kind of your soul you know it's bared right there it's your thoughts right there on the page looking through them going these are so wonderful the little thought bubbles he calls them where he puts the little circles together the bedrooms and the kitchens and just you know we want the bedrooms over here and we want this one over here and, and it's before it becomes a plan and I, th I saw that and I went oh, this is so wonderful we can do something with this wasn't quite sure what so that was our process. It kind of like evolved. I kind of went in with an idea, but then it evolved into something else. But then we thought, one thing we did think was, we do have to do one dicky piece, right? And so, I mean, we have to, and so we call it homage to Dicky because there's a, I guess I can say this, there's a little piece right here, this, right? This triangle piece on it oh, is a, a section from an original plan Dickey plan from Kula San Hospital. Is that correct? Yep. Yep. They have the plans. They did some work on it, and they had the big plan book down at their office there. The plans are like Dead Sea Scrolls, old, and I, I just happened to have it because I had done work up on the hospital, renovating a portion of it. And because we kept talking about Dickey and his details, it was fun to be able to take a, a small section of the plan and and enlarge it and modify it some and, and be able to incorporate it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we tried, the other thing too, is just speaking about the technique of this is, especially this one has the little palm trees in it, softening it, I love it. There's the, and there's the little painting that I did of the house is part of it. But trying to keep true to the architectural elements. So, one of the last things we did in this other piece um, was we thought we needed something on the one side, on the yellow side, needed just to balance it because you start with something but you still need to make it an artwork. It has to be compositionally pleasing and balanced. And so we thought, need something. And we had talked about maybe, Peter goes, maybe I can use the line work that they use on the edge of the plan. Like the lines they put on plans mean things. Like double lines mean something. Dotted lines mean setbacks, or what? Either overhead, hidden, or setbacks, depending yeah. on the size of the dashes. Yeah, uh, depending on the size of the dashes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I thought that was all, it's like code, you know? So this is architectural code on the end, this yep. little bit of line. Things that were beneficial is pretty much everything about the whole process, just from <laughs> Terry stopping in and us getting more and more excited, like, okay, yeah, we're going to do this. Let's talk about it. And going home and being able to think about something besides, oh, this project, I need to do this, and oh, I actually need to do laundry sometime. All of a sudden, I was like, wait, I need to be creative. And it was, that was actually, going back to what was tricky, for me to loosen up and just get out of drawing all the sharp technical bits was that was a hard it was hard for me to be like hey just let go and go back to being more free with your everything creativity and and how you're drawing and just loosen up which was also super beneficial mm -hmm. um, and I'm mm -hmm. I was excited I knew that would happen but it it took a little bit for it to kick off for me and then I was for example I started off retracing over some details and it was taking forever and I was like this is never going to work. We're going to have to speed it up. And, and there wasn't as much character or flavor. So then us getting into the process and being able to loosen up and just let it flow more was really beneficial to my health and my profession and just the <clears throat> overall experience and how much 
how much this became, and I'm super stoked and excited about what we've created. So. I think any time you go through a process like that, you come away so much more enriched. And I think for me, it was getting to understand the architectural process. I thought I knew what it was. I had no idea. I found out later, you know? And then I just realized, and I knew he was artistic because I'd been in this class with him and talked to him a little bit. But just to really um, come away with seeing what he goes through, I, I came away totally enriched. And to kind of work together with somebody who's, he's, Peter's like, my kids age you know and it's like so wonderful that we're all we all know each other they all know him you know went to school together and it's just i think it's a wonderful bridge um for us for me and um thank you peter it was, thanks for doing this with me thank it was you. so great <laughs> thank you Terry.